going to be a long cricket haul, that's all I can say. An interesting discussion I think we had a little bit last night in the chat while I was preparing for the broadcast, getting stuff set up. Asking what kind of, what do I do? What is it, what would I call it? Do I have a method or a framework? And uh, I don't think I came to a conclusion after discussing it. I realized in discussing it, though, I'm maybe two steps removed from really what most people think, think I'm talking about. And I don't I haven't figured out how to describe that. It's not, uh, again, I come here and do the broadcast and put out all this information. This is not just reporting the news. I'm, I'm looking at, at the content that I see, and I'm putting it in context of a historic pre-prepared place that all of us can see not be surprised by, that should inform us in how we act against it, given we want to be free of it. And so I, what I'm looking at is just an application of what I've been learning over quite a few decades. I don't know what you really call that, if we had to put it in context so it's easier to understand. So I, I struggle a little bit with trying to describe some of this stuff to you, so I don't know what, what else to do, but then just keep presenting it. And hope, hopefully people pick it up, maybe even by osmosis, because it's actually pretty natural to us once we, once you, you really focus in. And that's the key is, fo- that's why I say find, just find something. And just focus in on trying to remedy that, try to fix it, try to get it better. And a lot of this stuff starts to come out, uh, that we weren't told. For whatever reason. You know, there's no excuse about what the reason is, so I don't even need to put in, put in a title on that. The thing that we're up against is against us, and that's the uh, natural law. And so we have to throw that off. At least everything I've found says that we have to. Just horse sense will tell you that anything, something, somebody's riding your back, you bet you don't want it there, you got to buck it off. So this will be BTW RLM 293. For those of you on a uh, past cast or something, and uh, what the content. And I put the content of this is just really just the conversation that I'm going to have with you as I look through the different feeds for information. Things strike me to speak to you all. And underlying all that is an analysis that says we're not helpless and to stop these kinds of things. I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm going to explain to you at least a condition that you can go reference to then go seek the the information it takes to stop the problem. If you never see a problem in the world, or you want to stick your head in the sand against all problems, then I'm not speaking to you. And so that's the problem with this broadcast. Apparently there's not a lot of people that really want to take the responsibility it's going to take. You either take it, or we lose the whole thing. Whatever whatever that whole thing is that we were supposed to really strive for, we're lose. It's lost. And I can see very clearly that those uh, few people, or or groups of people that don't even maybe, maybe not even understand they're aligned together, how they're doing it. And, and those of us that look a little bit more, well, if I can say libertarian without uh, triggering a bunch of people, and without pigeonholing what I just said in, in a narrow spot, uh, those that just want to be left alone and, and, and be right, uh, do right by others and have them be d- done right by us, and uh, th- that seems to be a, a vanishing breed really quickly. And it's because those that don't believe that are organized up. The mob wins here. You're living in the democracy, whether you realize that or not, by not stepping up, and it doesn't take that many to do so. But it does require that we do that. And we're up against a pretty formidable foe. If oh, it ends up being the government of the United States that took uh, took the a left turn, if I can say it that way. Uh, we've been born into this problem. And people that understand it exploit it against us. So I try to, I try, I think I do enough, enough people, are, a few people respond to let me know that I'm doing it, whether or not it feels like it all the time, explaining to you how it's working and you can address these things. But you know, a handful of people is not going to make much of a dimple in the, in the ocean. That said, it's not going to take a lot of people, it just takes enough. And uh, you're behind a woodshed where you too, as we heard last week, it can be, or the week before, the, you can be the amyloid plaque whipping the viral virus, the government indoctrination and propaganda. That's where you take them behind the woodshed. I'm not taking you behind the woodshed, although that's uh, what it may sound like. And in some regards, I guess I could say that I do that periodically, but that's really just to bring the principles. The principles that you apply in order to re-correct re- this thing. 
or whatever you want to put the name on it. Because what we're actually up against isn't even the state. It comes under the color of the state. And everybody responds to that and misses the whole point. This is what the, my problem with the memification of the social networking is. There's nothing more to uh, to say. It's uh, it's failed, and yet it goes on and on and on and on. And I, it doesn't. It's as if that's the the that's the chosen communication in the face of an oppression, and no one understands that. That's where the uh, the indoctrination has brought people to. It's pretty fascinating, and they agree to all that, and they're sucked in. They plug into that silent weapons for quiet wars issue. And speaking of which, I don't know if it's going to say an alert. I didn't. I haven't been able to put any time to to study this, but there's an alert going on for Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Something's going on down there, folks. Um, just wanted to anybody who might be listening, and uh, if you're there, you probably know. Or this is an escalation of a continuing issue. You know, the people of Haiti are just one, probably the most, uh, other than Gaza, they're probably the most uh, definitive oppressed people that there are. You know, the Clintons are involved and all the money that was supposed to be sent to help them and all that disaster they've had. You know how they've been exploited. Well, something's going down in the politics of that area, and the United States military has been sent, is being sent in more to, uh, this weekend uh, due to a demonstration that was supposed to be called in opposition of all the corruption. Uh, the corruption in the government, uh, they're gonna, you know, they're going to replace it with another type of corruption. I don't know what side to look at this because I haven't looked at it, but the people in the existing government are now mur- murdering people, apparently silencing the the opponents. Uh, the military is going in, so those of you that have any interest in that, uh, the alerts are up from the State Department. The foreign, uh, for UK, the Foreign uh, Commonwealth Office, FCO, advised against all all but essential travel to Carrefour, Site Soleil, Liel, Martizant, and Bel Air areas of Port-au-Prince due to unstable and dangerous security situations. I chose that as a, an independent review of what might be going on because there's not really any any regular media about this going on right now. And then there's a State Department discussion uh, that link, and I have a uh, you'll have the blogcast where you can t- type this in if you wanted to see it if you're interested. The United States government embassy is also issuing these alerts. They're blaming it on this demonstration, but they're bringing in the military. And you have to understand that Haiti already has the UN there, and to me, this looks like the Republic of Congo all over again. Something's afoot. Just want to let you be, let you know as we kind of move into the reflection of what goes on in this country uh, and external countries, and the, 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 the destruction of other countries is, I think, what's uh, missing and transparent to the people of the United States. And I will just keep calling that out until I can see a change. It, as I said, you, you don't think it's Syria here. You look around and see the bombed out buildings in Syria. You don't realize too much where you live that that's what's going on. Some of us are so uh, distant from even the, the problems in the news we hear. We're, it's it even detached, like the homelessness. Now you look at uh, uh, Michigan. You look at the uh, Iron Belt. You look at uh, the industry. It's all destroyed. Uh, that I talked to you about this years uh, years and years ago. Uh, the uh, Detroitification, if you will, the uh, of America. Your 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 infrastructure's kind of dying, and you're going to find out the infrastructure they're building is the one that keeps you keeps you uh, builds the prison stronger against you. Uh, getting back to like 2001, they said America changed. Well, it didn't, but they were going to change it, and the plan was already afoot. That's why the PATIRT Act came in so quick. It was already afoot. People didn't understand any of that. Thought that was USA, 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 and you see how this incrementally has happened over the years. Uh, I'm not the only one to have identified it, but I'm probably one of the few that understand understand the method and mechanism that's being used against us that needs to be focused on. And I told you a long time ago, the worst somebody uh, beat us to the punch. As we we're going into 2000, my mind is saying, who's going to who's going to go to national security first, the people or the government? And if the government goes first, we're we're we may be out of the game here. Uh, there's still a couple of ways to get at it. That's what I keep telling you to do especially against these uh, the DHS-type conditions. You assert the fraud of the color of a uh, national security issue, and then you've got to have the proof for that. Now the burden's on you, but you can do it. I think you can do it. I see a lot of proof for it. Over all these years, the, 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 I think the evidence is there, but people have to step up to start outing this thing. As the, as the doors, the, the bars come up, and as the doors get locked more and more uh, solidly, uh, we see the United States government moving into a little beat-down place called Haiti, for whatever reason, it looks like it's the Congo again to me. It looks like we're going to have a regime change. We're talking about a coup. The government's no good anyway. It's all Clinton Foundation supported. Those people are the people that were in there are now moving. One of the guys, I guess, moved from Haiti back to Florida where he lives. 
one of the people that's in the big control situation. So uh, this is what, what happens in the world. Uh, this is what you may or may not understand happens to you in the bigger cities. And to the lesser extent, the war in, region, in what they call the regional or rural areas are being destroyed the same way. You just don't see the military. You don't realize that the infrastructure of the government has become that control. And for any of my detractors, the people that want to hear it, I don't know what to tell you. That's fine. You keep your head in that uh, acme uh, behind the woodshed acme bucket of sand. I don't know what else to say about this. And until uh, someone can start show me where my dedicated research over literally three decades and going on more now uh, is incorrect, uh, I have to go with what I know, not with what I think you know. And I, in fact, a colleague sent an, an email with a link over to some bureau, some attorney household talking about the patents and the liber it's a libertarian myth that these patents have power. Their attorneys are completely uh, uh, misleading people. They're uneducated in this land law. Uh, and it's it's very quickly pointed out if you just know the basic stuff. You don't have to understand the whole methodology of the attack. You just have to know your rights and property. These, are, these are, uh, attorneys are just no good. In their own presentation that says that these patents aren't anything, it shows the, the exception. And what I tell you, see how I analyze this is a little differently. They make a, a lie, they promote the lie that the patents mean nothing, and they include the exception that they're supposed to, that the Supreme Court they say honors. And I say, well, that's your notice in that when it says we're consistent with the admissions of the state and the, and the intention of Congress. Uh, these things have uh, the, only the rights they're gave. That's the point. That's where you say you only get the rights you assert. That's all the Supreme Court is saying there, that the attorneys are saying doesn't exist to you. Well, you can believe those people that are trying to torn your property, or you can start learning your rights. It's very subtle, this attack. And these people are one of, these, this bar association is one of the infiltrators, whether you want to agree with that or not, or whether you just want to give lip service to it. Everyone, oh, yeah, the bar association, and the jokes about lawyers. Fine, you can tell, keep telling jokes, or you can start working to figure out how to root them back out, like even the dumb miners knew about way back when in the 1800s. Why, where we, where'd that go in the backbone of America? So uh, anyway, Haiti's going down. I was gonna, I wasn't gonna talk too much of that. I'm not going to talk more about it. I just want to point you out there's a bunch of things going on in the world right down at the south of the border, and I have a, que I have a question about why they're doing that now, uh, why that's even a problem in a little place like Haiti that's uh, just run down and beat down. Their people are just oppressed and repressed and killed and whatever, uh, but it is right next to Cuba, and there's been some uh, chain rattling whether or not uh, Russia is going to be communicating with Cuba over some more missiles. Are we looking at 1962 again? And I don't think that we're maybe not. Again, the so-called history repeating itself is just a dynamic of, of oppressors in the world trying to find their, find, find their foothold uh, and, and keep people down. I don't like any of it. I'm not agreeing to any of it as far as the ability to do that, but that's what we are, that's the reality. And if you don't think the government has the power to bring in uh, the uh, armament that it needs in whatever fashion, you're not looking at international law too close to see that that's exactly what an uh, occupying force does in, against a, for, uh, an, inv an invaded territory. It's the same definition. And so what do I do or behind which I don't even really can't tell you. I just look at the condition versus the objective basis that everybody seems to want to diminish called the law, and I say, well, who's the big the law? Well, yeah, that's their rules of engagement. I said their rules of engagement. And in their rules of engagement, they make statements that say they can't engage in certain spots. And this is where I go to, to the an attorney uh, household that says that patents are a myth. This power of the patent is a myth. Why then, as I tell you, there's a statute in a, in a state that says the judiciary has no power to interfere with that patent. Forever. Right by its terms. There's a contract. As we learned in the mining district meeting here this Friday, the, the district uh, chairman says uh, he's in communication with someone out of California. There's a judge there. We don't have any identification. I'm going to have to take maybe track this down. He's recognized on his own, uh, his, well, on his own because it's not, it doesn't seem to be universal. The patent states, the, the authority of the patent gives him no power to interfere or decide. And this is in foreclosure cases which is the proper answer, because that's consistent with the other, the Oregon state law. It says there's no judicial power to interfere with these things. And these are, in, in California, they apparently were in foreclosure cases where the mortgager couldn't win because the patent is forever what it says. The mortgage is aside that. It's not attached to it. 
And so, we can believe these attorneys, we can believe the government, Athorita, whoever, we can believe everybody that wants to rip us off for their cha-ching, or we can start asserting the things I've been saying in, in the categories of, of a, a potential possible encroachment that we have to address. If you don't speak through it, at it through that, those avenues, you're likely not going to understand really how to narrow this whole thing down. Because if you find around, and we can do lip service about this and laugh and joke when it's a sad joke that we, we tell, oh, the government's here to helpful help you, and we hear all the evidence, if we don't get past that little point and actually help ourselves, this thing goes the way the people who have planned it to go will go. So if you want a recent, here's a recent evidence of the fact that the government's not here to help you, you have to figure it out yourself in an interesting little way that things happened and got around to do something. We just go to the California where the fires, federal government wants to say it's such a travesty, whatever the reason and excuses are, whatever all you all that want to d believe in DEWs, uh, directed energy weapons and all that other thing, I think is nonsense. The more I look at all this, there's no proof of none of any of it. But we do have a reality. People have died. People, there's fire burning everybody up and everything, not everything, and that's the other cool thing. Uh, but people are already coming to help where the government really doesn't want. Here's a story. A billionaire uses $25 million yacht to bring supplies to fire victims, but the police, happens to be the sheriff, the marine sheriff, won't let him ashore. If you think the government's here to help you. But you have to continue and persist. Here's, again, this is a kind of a neat thing. Uh, this uh, Howard Late, co-owner of the Malibu Rocky Oaks Winery, is a billionaire hearing tech industry mogul who lost most of his vineyard over the last week as wildfires raged uh, through California. And I have to say, uh, didn't rage everywhere. There's a, uh, was it Kanye West? He hired a bunch of firefighters. They stopped his uh, property from burning. And that was pivotal in, in stopping downwind pro, uh, homes from getting burnt. Now let's go to Paradise. Had the same problem. There was no actual outward suppression effort that was done that ought to have been done where a paradise example is a one man and, and, a couple, and a friend and a couple buckets five gallon buckets and a doughboy pool his house is still standing and so there's, there's a way to get at some of this I'm not saying diminishing the, the killer nature of a fire, the indiscriminate nature of, of the fire, Na nature is, is really all powerful but it's not uncontrollable even when it's uncontrolled but so you come to help and the sheriff's right there and the marine sheriff's right there to stop this this internet, uh, this um, um, billionaire from letting his supplies reach the people that need it. His misfortune did not deter him uh, from helping the victims and the, uh, have the fire, however. Last week, after Light uh, tried unsuccessfully to save his property from raging fire, he felt it was time to give back. He and he, So he contacted uh, his friend to build Kerbox, and uh, this week they rolled in the supply within, with the supplies. The problem is the sheriff was there to stop his yacht. And so what ends up happening, to get to the long story short on this, people from the land got on surfboards, hang 10, went out to the yacht, because they wouldn't let boats in either. They went out with surfboards, and they picked up supplies and ferried them to the land, back and forth. Fuel, I don't know how they did the fuel, but there was fuel, there was beer, lots of beer, food, water, lots of water. Folks, keep up with what, what they're bringing. Uh, and the people from the land were able to paddle out, and they were able to bring the stuff, and the sheriff couldn't stop that. I find, I haven't researched why. Why couldn't they, would they stop a boat, but not the, the surfboards? Might be your registration on your, on your, uh, your marine vessels. They're in commerce and subject to this, this control. The surfboards, obviously not. But look at what the sheriff would do to stop helping people. And they have their reasons. But is it valid? And is it, is it the last word? No. The surfboards win this one. And so this is the kind of, you may only have the small avenue to fight back against this. I'm asking everyone to find their surfboard, I guess. I've talked about the tsunami that you, a long time ago, especially when the tsunamis were hitting in the Fukushima and all that, I said, you know, this is, whole situation is like finding a tsunami, surfing the tsunami. It's an example of that. Maybe not the tsunami, but the people with surfboards came out and helped other people that need the help because the government, the sheriff keeping the peace, wants to keep death, apparently. So so peaceful, it's death. Would not allow the people to uh, come from the ocean. It's all interesting when you look at the Marine and, and Internet and Admiralty and all that. You look at that. It's pretty interesting what's going on here in the authorities. But the landed people came out with their surfboards that were on uh, devices that were not regulated. 
Uh, I can't find any other connection than that. So point is that uh, you're going to have to be prepared. Government's not there to help you. You're going to have to have the answers. And the best thing to do is figure out what the law is going to be in these circumstances. You want to be prepared. Be prepared in, in your in your objection to their in, uh, un, unwarranted, unwarranted interference, the color of authority felony. Like I've told you about the minors, finding the one sentence, the one sentence exception against the government authority allowed minors to go into the forest when the forest was closed to most everybody else. And this is the thing I'm trying to tell you. It's, there's a now we're down inside. Because we have to do this is by reverse definition that you live in an occupied territory, you live in a prison. That you can do it shows that there's rules even within the constraint of the prison. I'm saying you're going to have to go find those. Anybody, my detractors, anybody that wants to go do something else, wants to think of it differently, think I don't have nothing to contribute, or think that they're too old or whatever, anybody who doesn't look at what I'm saying and do it really the way I'm saying it and claims to be libertarian or claims to be free or just gives up and just says I'll live my little life, that's being free enough. You're not helping and you're, you're probably hurting because there's no example, but the rest of you have to go, really, you'll find you're going to be doing what I'm saying. Not because I'm saying it, because that's the only thing that's left to us. How do I know that? Go read the black and white. It's everywhere. Go read it. It's right there for us to see. In a way, I'm admitting I'm not free. And I have to, you got to do that before you get, you got to kind of lose everything before you got nothing else to lose, right? Severe t principle truths in some of these statements that we hear in music, and some not so much, but anyway. You can pull pull from everywhere the goodness uh, of what you, we ought to know that we may have not have been told. And so, billionaire comes out, you know, if you want to talk about corporate this and corporatocracy that, here's a corporate guy who made billions uh, doing uh, market stuff, and he comes back immediately, his view is, I'm going to continue to help even though I've lost. But, you know, I wish the world was more like that amongst more people. But I'm, I'm not the determiner of that for, for, for anybody else. We see evidence of it here. So, what was interesting is that the he tried to pull into a place called Paradise Cove. For all you conspiracy connectors, he was uh, stopped from going into Paradise Cove, essentially uh, the same name as the Paradise, California. So I don't know if there's a connection. Just interesting correlations. So we see the government is not here to help us, as we know, but we give lip service when we say it. We just say it. We, we think that answered the whole problem. Uh, I'm trying to remind you over and over, that's not going to solve a thing. That we recognize a problem does not solve it. That did come out in the chat last night. Talking about, I said, you know, you're not looking for the why. That's probably the cause. When you find the harm, you know the why. What you have to do is figure out how to eject the why to stop causing the harm. And so we, the why is really not important here because that should be solved in identifying the harm you want to stop. Because you, you, if you're honest about it, you'll find the cause immediately to the harm. That's the why. And so, this is what I say. I'm not talking directly to do sales. Oh, the government did it. No, the government done it. Now, what are we going to do to stop that problem? Whether it hurts you directly or someone indirectly, and you have the like this guy. He's not has nothing to pay, uh, get his yacht to fill, put food and try to help people. That's not not that, no no benefit to him actually directly. It's just something that you do about that. That's what I'm asking us to, that we step up in that maybe that if we have nothing direct to do. That's, that's, we, we have our own yacht and we go try to deliver it. We find the sheriff, uh, in the water before us to help out someone that we're out intending to help. And we ask the other people that we're intending to help to come and connect up with us to make that association. You have the right of association. That was another thing I noticed uh, that they had to let. But you do it all right there in the face of the authority. The thing that's supposed to declare the benefits to you is the very thing you start to see that's the harm so that's the why now how do you solve it well their answer was to get people with surfboards hang 10 so the government's going to do whatever it can whenever it has the opportunity to to stop you it will set up databases before you got there in order to put you in classes and, and uh, statuses that you may or may not understand you are in that do the controlling and they stick you in a system that's been established that uh, you watched happen, and we're crickets too. And I keep telling you, it's here uh, going on. Now we come after so many, so many years after the when America they said America changed. Uh, it was like I suspect it was just reorganized, and a new rule happened. It, it was a, uh, now the new rule is really what 
I was concerned with when I was looking in the 90s, coming into 2000, who was going to grab the mantle of the national security? Uh, the people with the government against them, oppressing them, or the government itself to be able to jump before the fact? It was the government. They said America would change because they did that, and they're going to go on national security. And so you see what's happened all that time. It's pretty self-evident now, but most people don't realize that's what's happening. Today we start to hear a little more of what's going on about all this and the establishment of this new order. You can go look out in the world about the new world order. They're talking about the world. They're talking about is the United States itself as well. The United States of America being the object of their occupation, their the United States government turned to an oppressor, which didn't happen in 9-11. It happened way back around Lincoln's time, which is, causes me my astonishment when I hear these see these people in social network that are supposed to be the gurus of knowledge and history, and they're, uh, they're uh, uh, lifting up Lincoln. It was just another attorney, all right? So as I said before, the attorneys who will, will knock down patent law they are not trained in that either. Go look at their CLEs. They're not trained in patent law, so they don't even have a say, first of all. Uh, and uh, But they'll they'll come and they'll uh, torn your property away from you. It's like an occupation. You hand it over to them because you think you need representation. Instead of just going back and learn the simple black and white, like I tell you, the miners learned the one sentence that said that the one sentence right there in the black and white that the official oppressor who would act in your ignorance of it would oppress you with could not do that. One sentence, not the entirety of the law, not the entirety of what I talked to you. I've learned, I come the hard way around to find it all out, but it gives me foundation to prove it to myself before I get here. One sentence was enough. And I can't get uh, but a handful of people to start looking for that one sentence that does it for them. But uh, DHS, now we've got this military occupation, now in earnest, now declared so, now declaring the mantle of national security, which is the ultimate police power uh, concern for them, uh, which makes them look even more official because you think it's police power and not an occupier. But the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, you should have figured out home. When they use the word homeland, we were in trouble. A little bit different than the fatherland, if you didn't think it were much different than Russia in our in our oppression. Notwithstanding how good everyone wants to make Putin look, uh, we we are pretty much similar. When you start looking at what well, they want to bring in smart cities, Russia wants to bring in smart cities with their Asian connection, you'll start seeing this is a global construct that's working everywhere. Nobody is really outside of that. Now, the United States ought to be because it's counter to everything the global order could put on us. Partly, and most pro probably the most distinctly, in its property laws. So you can get an attorney who's an NGO to the UN to impose in, and in their organizations it tells you they're going to promote sustainable development, which is the destruction of your way of life. You can go and get the advice from them, or you can go learn your land law. You can go learn the authorities, as I keep suggesting people, learn the basics of the property law, the land law, learn the relationships of grantees, grantors, the beneficiaries, the trustees. And now I realize I'm talking so fast. I keep doing that. I can't slow down. It just starts coming out, folks. I, I don't prepare. I don't write this down, folks. It just starts to come out. It's that simple to understand once you read the black and white and prepare for it. And so you have this authority in you that it, once you read it cannot be stripped from you. And those that will not do what I'm asking and will disregard what I'm saying or have a con contrary authority, as a, or not a their opinion, because there is really no authority against this. This is not something I opine. It's something that you read and how it works. It's just something you observe, and then I say, I turn around and apply it. Don't just know it. And circle, if, if you have what I'm doing, because I'm doing it again, if, if you're listening or whenever you listen, if you have what it is I'm doing that isn't a method or a framework, we can encapsulate what it is I do. Maybe you're right to find an identity for it, but I, I, just, I don't think it's a framework or a method. All the work I say on the broadcast is already all this stuff applied. And I'm just pointing to people, like I said, I make the path. Said, Here's a path for this subject matter. This is how you'll have to start to address it. You may find more specifics on how to do more detailing work, but you're going to have to get in and do that. Here the DHS has come on. They told us they're going to come on. Uh, the Silent Webbers for Quiet Wars document that I have listed at the bottom of every broadcaster told us this was coming. If you could read between the lines and look past the, the novel fiction of the electronics, which is not really so far off, when you understand electronics, but it, but it is kind of bizarre when you look at it. You look through that, 
as to what they're saying. And you see the society told that that document was written about decades and decades and decades ago. I'm pausing here, folks. Quiet on the set. Decades ago, before all this stuff, they would say we would be plugging into this thing. DHS-wide biometrics program issues detailed in data mining report to Congress. Comprehensive legally mandated new Department of Homeland Security DHS Privacy Office's data mining report to Congress provides detailed updates on modifications, additions, and other developments to, the num to numerous department-wide programs that involve extensive data mining and biometric information to support DHS's mission to protect the homeland and provides examples of its effectiveness. This is a document for those of you that don't think, that don't like TSA, that don't like the expansion of the borders, that doesn't like the bank accounts being, your bank accounts being tapped, that, that uh, don't like anything that was in the Patriot Act and anything subsequent to that, that's NDAA. This report is what you need to get. I haven't read this report. I can tell you though by what they say, it's critical to understand what they're talking about. For everything that they put in here and they affect red-blooded Americans, if I can say that without triggering too many people or limiting the word and just meaning what I mean, people in America and not the North, not the South, but they're right there in America, the United States of America, the Americans, whatever their status has been tainted by the government to say, you'll look and see this DHS report that protects the United States from outside threat can't be you, but they're applying it to you, is what you need to see. That's all I need to see. That was consistent with what? With my reading of the title, the title 8 of the United States Code regarding immigration. Whatever the status is they, you don't understand or they put on you or whatever. It doesn't detail us, the Americans that were born here. I, well, born, see, all these words are trigger words. Uh, what we were birthed here, oh, there's another admiralty word. Well, I can't even talk, can I? You were born, you were brought into this, in this place and you're put on this land for everyone wants to poo poo the, the land of being a problem. I don't see no borders. There's reasons for these artificial borders and you gotta get into that and understand what it is and you may, you may not like them, but you have to understand what their purpose is and whether, you're gonna have to decide whether that purpose was functional and, uh, does do what it's supposed to do and properly done, I think it is. Uh, therefore, you have to look and see why the, these things are done in every country. Uh, they're not every, see, despite what the UN wants to say that everybody should be equal, not everybody is equal. Despite the equality in the law for civil rights and the extortions of every kind, and everyone will ex equally agree with that, be uh, subject to that, no one is actually equal. And that relates and reflects to nations. And so there may be serious problems coming in with influxes of people that are not, if you will, controlled for another triggered word. You have to control the influx of people for lots of reasons. Now, I don't know when you start to see the negative side of that influx uncontrolled, I don't know if there's going to be many people that are going to really agree. And at some point you start to have to wonder, if you can agree to the worst of the, uh, oh, bring it on attitude, I have to worry about you. You, you need to take a step back on your own thoughts and your own hubris and figure out that there's just certain realities that we deal with. That DHS has have, uh, made another report. If you look through this report, it was interesting as you keep reading through this report. Again, I'm, I don't, I want to read because I explained it to you, but I want to, I don't want to spoon feed you, but I want to spoon feed you. It doesn't seem like people pipe, type pick, quite pick all this stuff up. I got to almost spoon feed you, and I don't want to insult money people about doing that either. And so for those of you that say, well, why don't you read to us more? Okay. I guess I can open my little book and we can all go back to slumberland. I can read to you. Or you understand I'm talking to you about this stuff for important reasons, and you got to go figure out what that reason is. I'll give you a little bit of a lead on the path, and you go work it out. I know if you work it out, you got investment, you're going to be looking for the right stuff. You're not going to be putting up with a bunch of nonsense like I hear going on with those that pretend to be doing this stuff. Uh, but they have a uh, the DSNH programs now. They've listed the program. They talk about it. They talk about department goals and objectives. Well, that's the sustainable development way, isn't it? So you already know this is a subverted state to begin with. They talk about data mining, biometric data mining. I told you they're going to get it through the public-private partnerships. They're into goals and objectives. That's the method that they do it. All this is predictable. The following DHS programs in biometric and personal identifiable information, PII, uh, data mining were enlisted. 
the automatic uh, targeting system, which administered by CBP, all these three-lettered agencies, it includes the module for inbound and outbound cargo, uh, land barter crossings, and passengers. Well, passenger is an interesting word. Cargo is an interesting thing. But there's a whole system program, for ATS program for that, the analytical framework for intelligence, AFI, which is administered by CPB. This is now critical. Uh, CPB is a focal point. AFI provides enhanced search and analytical capabilities to identify, apprehend, and prosecute individuals who pose a potential law enforcement or security risk and aids in the enforcement of customs, immigration, and other law enforcement enforced laws enforced by the DHS at the border. Well, let's look at customs, immigration. Customs and immigration. Does that have to do with anybody? Well, unless you're crossing the border. I'm not addressing the right to travel at this point. I've talked about it before. I'm talking about just a, this pro, could this program affect you inside the borders if you don't go through, let's say, customs. And what about immigration? Well, if you're not an immigrant, why don't we look at it this way? Look at the limitations here. Look at the silence of what's not being spoken to. Is the limit of their authority? Why don't we look at it this way? The Falcon Data Analyst and Research and for Trade the Transparency System, which is administered by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Does that have anything to do with you, even if you were coming in the country with your stuff? I'm talking private now. The Falcon Roadrunner System. We go behind the woodshed with Wiley Coyote's little umbrella here in an Acme bucket of sand. The Falcon, the Falcon Roadrunner system, which is administered by ICE, is that having to do with you? The DHS the data framework, which is the DHS wide initiative. I guess that has nothing to do with you so far. The Socrates, Socrates, S O C R A T E S pilot program, which is administered by CP, CBP. The fraud detection and national security data system. All these that acronym, acronym, which is administered by the U.S. Uh, USCIS Fraud Detection and National Security Directorate. What, what about the for they pose everybody to be uh, the associate everybody to be fraud committing fraud? You're not innocent anymore. Now someone has said that they, we might not be, but I say that's where you challenge it, isn't it? Do you uh, allow these people to s declare for you what your rights are? Do you say, wait a minute, there's a limitation? Do you stand up for yourself? Those of you that are really, really smart about this, where are you? There's also a global enrollment system that collects biographic and biometric data that applicants, U.S. and non-U.S. citizens. Now, how can they group those two together under immigration? How do they do that? You ever ask yourself how that is possible? What if it's not? What if they're just doing it? And what if it is? Think about that. You really... Really think about this. Now we go back to the distinction between the U.S. government and the district and the states of the Union and the United, uh, United States of America. See, look at that. Do they have the right to do what they're doing? I'm not so sure, but we let it go by. We listen to the lawyers. I don't, I don't, I don't know about a lawyer. They don't do law. They, they do destruction. They're at Torners. The, the Pay for Use Trusted Traveler Program included Canadian border de de dedicated compu commuter lanes, Nexus, and the Secure Electronics nat nat Network for Travelers Rapid Inspection. You see the money that's being spent to do all this stuff? We still haven't got to the point of it, though. I'm, I'm alluding to the point of it, but we still haven't got to the point. And yet everybody goes through this, uh, will allow this, or doesn't do something, and doesn't do the administrative side. We said, I've told you it was going to be an administrative discussion you have to have, and the courts have come back and confirmed that today. Now I mean, now we're into that day, we can see that. This is now a report that talks about all these things that they've been put up, programs, programs and projects and demonstration. There should have been a NEPA on this. Why don't you go look at that one? That would be an interesting inference, and they'll tell you that national security uh, was allows them to avoid it, and you just say, well, that was a fraud. And you're extending it out upon the people that are not, you're presuming guilty without a right. This uh, Sentry program collects collected biographic and biometric information and in, in, in is used to run criminal background and terrorist and terrorist checks on applicants. What happened to the presumption of innocence? You say it's not there. Well, I'm telling you, then you don't live in a constitutional republic, and you better be really concerned about that. And there's a way to address it. But more importantly, who are they supposed to be after? And remember, your phones are involved in this. Why do they have the right to attack your phone? Are those foreign too? Or are those presumed foreign? And they don't have a right to do that. 
Why? Because they get to grab those things and take them from you, and the courts have said that's okay. And no one says anything about this. In addition, there's an AID, an automatic identification tag, that stores a unique serial number that can be leaked to a traveler profile, so profiling, that was supposed to be off limits, but they do it because no one challenges, including biometric and biographic data. AID issuance with unique uh, assigns a unique automation identification in, this, in scope travelers at secondary inspections. The uh, automated targeting system, who are they targeting for us? Uh, well, next thing will come the drones, I'm sure, which uh, automatically, how are they going to identify you? Because of your phone, or they identify you because of your tags, and they're all interacting with the environment that, that the phone's actually putting out to generate electricity inside in order to power themselves up to identify where you are and what you are, who you are, uh, your characteristics, and all this other stuff. System which uh, This system will be automatically cross-referenced to ECS cross-data and other information to provide a weighted, weighted, weighted social credit, weighted, rules-based score, no law, uh, based for their vehicle to to the primary CPB uh, POE officer. And then we got to deal with an officer, and that's fine. You can do that. But here they're giving you the clues on how you address all this as I read through this. Um, but it doesn't matter, does it? I can talk to you about it. And if you're interested, oh, it sounds interesting, I'll listen. But don't do anything. I'm wasting my time. You have to understand that this is a rule report now that comes from them. It admits what the limitations are, and you can uh, drive the, this problem right to the bank. Well, hopefully the, uh, not their bank, your bank, the one in the ground, the one that the wealth comes from, that the land that your feet stand on that says, I'm from here, not from where your jurisdiction is. The score is determined not a free man on the land either, because that is something that's been status changed uh, uh, to them uh, to, to that they vilify and you have to go to the acts of Congress that allow you to have a different status than the one they're imposing and then you challenge it and that's happening right now as, as that the term a so sovereign citizen is being used by the government over and over I told you this was coming but you now almost can't escape it and it's one of the discussions you start having it's not really much of a discussion you, you show how that's a fraud a mischaracterization a presumption of guilt that they can't prove and no record shows and then they use it for an unwarranted use. That's a felony. And uh, if they do it through the mail, that's mail fraud. Now you got them. Now you can build up anybody that works with them as RICO, racketeering influence, corrupt organization, your prerequisite elements that you need. It's all there to do if you just sit down and plan it out, folks. You know, send you an email. That's another part of the mail fraud. You, you get these guys real easy when you start understanding. Uh, don't fight it. Uh, just see what they're doing and identify it. Just strictly identify it. Don't think you're so smart. Just identify what the guy, what the guy's doing, contrary to the objective basis that uh, you otherwise would run away from, called the code. Yeah, it's a code. And when you have the magic decoder ring, things start to look a little different. At least they do for me. The score determines the score. There's social credit here. Through the immigration. The score determines whether the vehicle needs to be referred to a secondary lane or further inspection. Your vehicle. As a social credit. And so you get pre-profiled and you get directed through this process. But they're not saying who it's supposed to be on. And so we go on license plate reader. We talked about all this stuff. The machine readable travel document. All the news you heard was coming out like little piecemeal. This report has all of that and more what they've been doing since 9-11. On the pretext of a national security imperative. The machine readable trans, uh, tra travel document, the tra for readable traveler information. So who who is this this traveler? See, it's kind of missing. You just assume that it it has to do with you. But when you see that ICE is involved, you start to realize as you read through this that they're not talking about people in America, Americans. They're ad actually talking about the people that are foreigners trying to get in and go out. What is their authority to contain non-immigrant information if you've never had any in any connection to a problem? They have a file for that. No one challenges it. Again, they were keeping this kind of secret. You, it used to be kind of hard to challenge it. This report allows you to open the door for all this stuff. ADIS is a central repository 
restoring, reconciling, and reporting on immigrant and non-immigrant traveler arrivals and departures across air, sea, and land ports. Ports of entry are POEs. We heard it before. I didn't define it. POEs are ports of entry. Ports. Entry. Border. ADIS, uh, ADIS matches arrival and departure to identify illegal overstays and provides a wide range of ad hoc queries and reporting capabilities for arrival and departure information. Now, it might be said that they have the right to do that, but is the overstay from where? When you're coming, if you're an American coming back, is that overstay actually valid? You're coming back. So I'm reading along here. They're talking about being put into heightened risk, uh, security risks. How? Where is this? Why is this presumption of guilt on all this? And who again does it pertain to? The over uh, the three years ago, the overstay candidates process was eliminated, and the weekly overstay leads process was moved to a daily process, streamlined to streamlining the overall process of overstays. Again, did anybody comment to the problem of the inclusion of people that it shouldn't include that were just kind of going by the wayside, being absorbed up into the system, being rendered by this machine, this new America that they were telling us was coming on. It's to me, I don't read anything different right there than the cannabis problem. Right there, same, that came in my mind immediately. You say, well, why? Well, because they're treating it the same way. They're making the same assumptions and presumptions that are unchallenged that they get away with. It, it's, it's, that's how my mind works. I don't know what else to say to explain it. If you listen to my past broadcast about the cannabis, you're just kind of hearing what I'm saying now, I hope. So, they, they speak about the uh, in-scope non-immigrant entries departed the United States on time in accordance with the terms of their admission. That's not you either. And so, when you start to look at this, they're talking about immigration, people that are foreigners coming in. There's hardly anything I see it here except for the assertion of a non-immigrant which can be someone who's an immigrant but non-immigrant. It's like a permanent resident who still don't have their citizenship. You have to look inside to see the immigration is inside the immigration problem of, of dealing with people that are coming in and out from foreign, from foreign countries. But this, if you read through this and you see this report and what they're talking about, if you know what you're looking at, they're telling you that this is what they're doing to you. Uh, but they're also explaining that there may not, it uh, doesn't look like they have set any authority for any of what they're doing, and they're applying it on innocent people. And so I asked uh, in, a, in a Twitter in response is, what does any of this have to do with presumed innocent Americans? The hashtag is by what lawful authority? Well, and I don't see how that is a, a extremely re a wild question to ask. We say it all the time. We joke about authorita. That's the question. By what authority? That's the same thing you do for a quo warranto. By what authority? It's the same thing you do when you're identifying someone without a warrant under color of a law. You ask that question right up front. How does all this law affect, or, uh, apply to presumed innocent Americans? Where did that go? And you say, oh, it went out, it went out the window. Well, then you're in a cage. You put yourself as a slave to the system instead of standing up to fight it. I got a response back from Blacklisted News, who I sent that out to. It's a great question, though I think everyone is presumed guilty by the state. What's the authority of the state to presume guilt? Is the point. Why are we allowing this stuff to come down? I've told you it's a way to address it. Why are we allowing it to come down unchallenged? And then what's our complaint? that we, When, when they impose what, they've allowed, what we've allowed them, we've volunteered it to them. And I asked back uh, through that, uh, they presume it, uh, uh, they presume the guilt, the state presumes the guilt, by what authority? I asked, the, I make this point, because I'm trying to explain, we can look at all this stuff and witness it, but there's something we can do. And I try to, like, like in my Twitter feed, I also try to always put in some kind of a action, reverse action to counter this, hoping someone will step up. I can't do all this stuff. I'm hoping the people that are, are looking in are interested. So I ask this question, which is always usually not a question, more than the point. Wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be an interesting administration challenge testing the least imposition of national security versus the very thing the government was to keep 
the presumption of innocence, the failure of which destroys the very establishment which government was to protect, lost before the DHS was ever created. Securing what now? Now, I don't know if anybody can read through what I just said or understand what I just said. Why did I go to testing the least imposition challenge of national securities? Because if you go look at the court cases and what they're supposed to do, all impositions are supposed to be the least restrictive and the least imposition on your travel. This system that they try to make automatic isn't that least imposition where you realize it's a central database that was never given to anybody to do. Your right to travel is free of any monitoring as well, where they can't find anything else. There's no probable cause. The national security is a pretext is the unwarranted imp imposition upon your rights to do so is a felony. Wouldn't that make an interesting challenge in the administrative side? Because that's where you're going to have to go. I keep telling you that. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be one of the things you'd want to challenge this whole setup for? No, it doesn't mean you challenge the existed lawfulness of it. No, that's lawful, but applied to what? That's where the limit comes. And if they have lost, I told you this a long time ago, if we're now to where we are, the government failed its fiduciary duty to protect us from this. I think that's somewhat of a brilliant, if you will, if I could say that, a brilliant attack. What are they securing now then? And I don't have to deal with it either that, you know, it's not a contract for us and all that. No, no, they were set up to do, these people that are in these offices were set up to do certain things. And if you frame, see, the framing is not what I do, it's what you're going to be doing in the context of your discussion, and hopefully not an argument, but a position that's unassailable. You frame this context in a fraud and an unwarranted condition that they fabricated and against what you had sitting in you, which is essentially, we can put it in one little phrase, there's a whole lot behind this. The free, uh, the, pub, the, the uh, presumption of innocence is also the presumption from association, uh, having to for, be forced in association. Lots of things start popping up here. But the presumption of innocence being one, where do all those programs ad uh, address in the least impactful way your right to be presumed innocent? where you're presumed to be a terrorist. I would love to see right, properly advanced before this, uh, this condition, just to see what the answer is going to be. You're right on the narrow path. They're going to have to, you're going to have, they're going to have to call themselves out because they can't stand on the narrow path if you're standing on it. The problem is you have to get it from them. Like this report, is their admission all this is going on? I don't have to go wait for all the, uh, new, all the news coming off the Internet. The official report condemns them to do these things for these purposes. Now you piece through that, you parse through it, and you figure out what are they doing in violating people when they bring everybody involved? That requires you know your rights, not from the Constitution, just that you know your rights. That's first. Then you look back and see if there's a con constraint on that to them. That's when you look back at the Constitution. But if there's a document that goes before that, like let's say in a patent that, that precludes all interference, you use that instead. You don't have to challenge. You don't go back to the Constitution to prove the validity of the document. You just use it. You accept it's authoritative. And remember, that's not a speaking man or woman in a uniform. That's a piece of paper. Can I say at that point, the pen is mightier than the sword? And then you find the acknowledgement in states that the power of the judiciary cannot extend to interfere with that forever? By the terms of its contract? Oh, well, there's a contract. So getting back to this, wouldn't, don't you think, well, I've been telling you this is an administrative challenge. I've told you this challenge before. Where people believe there's a presumption of innocence, I'm saying that's, your, that's where the, you stick the crowbar right underneath the limpet on that rock and you pry that limpet right off that rock. You take that little beastie and you pop him right off the rock that it's trying to keep you from standing on. When you read the article and you see that there's no presumption of innocence in even the United States, uh, uh, the people that live in the United States, and they treat you all the same even as foreigners, that's your in. And this is where we've come since the 9-11 thing, and the Twin Towers and all that stuff. As I said, I was standing there on the TV 
uh, saying they went and done it. Why? Because I had already seen the documents saying they were planning to do that. What my question was, are they going to pull that trigger? And boy, they did. They don't. These people are really real psychopaths. They pulled that trigger at 9-11, the one that was planned and sitting there and planned for and ready to execute. Did I know how they were going to do it? No, I just knew that they were going to have to do that. And they did it. And my only observation of 9-11 wasn't horror. Uh, I mean, it's nasty what you see, and yeah, a lot of people died. It was that there's an evil in this country. There's a psyche, a psychotic psychopathy in this country that will pull that trigger. And now we're living under it and those that did it. And it's systemic. And that's on top of everything, anything else I might talk about within the public land laws and the things about defending yourself and the county defending itself. That this is a totally different issue. But on that point, the U.S. has killed half a million and spent six trillion dollars on war since 9-11. This is the psychopathy working in the world. This is how they turned it around on you. You don't see that, but they did it, and then they went out in the world. And I can't even conceive the term six trillion. It just doesn't even have a sense for me. Maybe you can. I can't. I just stop. I just stop even thinking about it. This is stupid. And people continue to allow it. In the aftermath of the deadly 9-11 terrorist attacks, the United States has spent over $5.9 trillion on wars abroad that have resulted in the deaths of an estimated 500,000 people according to the Costs of War research published in the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Rhode Island Browns University. The report published this month reveals that 370,000 people have died directly from violence related to U.S. wars. We can go on and on and on. I can read all the numbers. The problem is that this is what triggered this whole thing. It moves on to 5.9. Uh, 5 you find out that it's not. The value has to do with things that are actually ex also external to that. The funds that they use to, for these wars aren't just to go over there. They have costs that help prosecute the war here that they spend. And this is what I've been telling you about. Forget it. Watch out. When you look out and they're doing it somewhere else, they're actually doing it here. They have money they spend in country. To, for whatever reason, we can tell them the, the propaganda, we can tell the MSM, you know, the, speaking, uh, the speaking agents of the propagandists, the government, you can say whatever it is, uh, it, that's money spent here against you. That's part of that money. And we already know, we've talked about and reported behind the woodshed about the removal of the uh, prop, uh, propaganda, uh, propaganda restriction on the media. You know, like like it was any restriction before, but there's no prosecutions. It didn't matter. But now there's no there's no restraint anymore. And we all look at that and laugh. I mean, okay, now the now we know for sure the MSM is is a propaganda tool. Well, I say use it, but nobody does. We're told lots of things since since 9/11. Lots of things are happening, uh, but they're doing it underneath our again crickets. We we just do not respond, and the writings are everywhere to read it. Uh, the money that they're spending, I don't know, that's on your good faith and faith and credit. It's on your back, they say. But, and, and since no one says anything about that and tests that, I suppose that's true, isn't it? But who has the power? And when you don't, when you realize you don't have the power, I think you better reassess what you're really sitting in. What What is this place that does this? And I'm, I certainly don't have a, I don't have the mind of all the real hideous things in the world. I think reading, reading the Machiavelli's book there, I think that told me quite a bit. I still can't conceive, like I can't conceive of six trillion of anything. I mean, yeah, my mind can picture things that might be six trillion, but I mean, there's no no tangible connection to it. It's it's the same thing. Well, how how evil can how big how bad can evil be? I mean, you just it's the same problem when you read Machiavelli. I don't think that people, good people, can conceive of how bad it is, and that's our problem. That's where it operates. It operates just outside of what we actually see. And so, there's a price tag to all this. Is This one report we'll talk about. United States wars, based on this whole facade and pretext, and we now see this whole thing set up through DHS to collect up, like silent weapons or quiet wars is telling us, you're going to be put into, you're going to be forced into places if you don't agree and volunteer. You're going to be deemed to be volunteer. Remember, voluntary servitude 
is is legal. And then and then what people didn't realize, they just create it to look like it's voluntary servitude. And when you don't say something about that, that's what they just so called justify all this to do. And so there have been, again, the military, again, I guess I'm pointing on the military is a consistent companion of our societies, uh, globally and locally. In the United States of America, they're no different in Canada, no different in the, United, in the UK, nowhere is different. The global order was in when they were telling us about it, a long time back, a long time ago. And so, we'll go down there, but this is a little thing came through, looking at the military consequence and how long ago we've been told, and uh, 20 years, and we're still crickets to it all, how much it's costing, I don't know, again, things I can't even conceive, things I can't even really get to conceive. In the, in, a, uh, in the false front saying that the government's here to protect you, treating you as a criminal. No one says anything. When someone comes to help you, you're sitting there on Malibu shore, and a yacht pulls up to throw food your way, and the sheriff steps in between you, you got to know something's not right. You got to realize that you're. What is that? You got to ask that. What is it that allows this? Uh, where's the empathy? Even the sheriff outside of his office or his deputies outside of the office. Where did we go, folks? And we want to communicate. Uh, we have people that have communicated long term and getting vilified about what they communicate. It was uh, again through the. Again, my view is through this military consequence. Not solely, but where it looks like it's playing, I look right. That's immediately the pot, the category I go to because it's easier and faster to. I look to try and disregard it or dis, um, disprove it. If I can't, I just assume we're in a military consequence. A long time back, in the same time period, necessarily too, because they were trying to tell us something that people just wouldn't agree to. Kind of like reading the bar association's admission they promote sustainable development, and everyone's poo-pooing sustainable development like it doesn't exist. Agenda 21? Oh, you're a fool. Ten hat. Well, but it's the point is, is when you look in the documents, they say they didn't say Agenda 21 here in America. They did it over in Europe. And they're the same thing. And so the so-called conspiracy theorists, uh, which may very well be without cause, those of us that are reading the black and white, though, see see something else. I don't know that I've ever been called a conspiracy theorist, though. Why? Probably because I can just point to the document that proves it's just happening. And this is one of these other things here. The military control has been on us. You can't tell me that something that happened in 2001 uh, that admits to the thing that's going on it can be disregarded as something else. And then all of a sudden it's just coming on us. And when we see that this has been a plan for the 20 years that we've been crickets, I'm hoping maybe somebody will get to get some of you. will start to say, okay, well, there is something we really need to look in on. We need to figure out ways to start cracking the porcelain on this thing. That, uh, the military consequence, you look at through what they can do, and I've talked to you about Title 15, all the money that's spent, and predictably, while the money they were planning on spending, uh, came up in a little Twitter that came in, uh, someone saying, but chemtrails are just a conspiracy theory, and they have a picture of chemtrails and all this stuff. And someone called UFO Case Alien replies, and a weapon system, which reminded me of that very act, and they provided a copy of a picture of the part of the text of the bill that explained that chemtrails were identified back in 2001 for all you naysayers or whatever you were. And I can't tell at that time I was proven that every... A uh, line I saw in the sky was going to be a chemtrail because at the time they weren't really doing that much. And a lot of the people that were calling chemtrails everything in the sky, and they were easily identifiable. Any of us, of us that knows, knows, knows about meteorology and know, knows about the physics and of the air and all this other kind of stuff, you, you, you have a sense of what you're looking at. And at the time early on, not everything was a chemtrail. It seems like it's kind of reversed, obviously reversed the other way, although periodically you can find a contrail. But the chemtrails was there, and they were part of a military plan, and we get the proof of that. All the, Some of this money that was spent and going to be spent was built on chemtrails that was identified in a bill that you can get a link to. It was called the Space Preservation Act of 2001. And in it, you'll see, as a weapon, chemtrails is listed. What I found important is that not just that it was chemtrails and was highlighted in the, in the Twitter, but uh, uh, Section C, to me, is even more powerful statement because of what it tells us. 
and what it speaks to. If you stop looking at the lines in the sky and go read out why the lines are in the sky and the authority that they've given, the government has given itself to violate you, then maybe your focus will be different. I'm not even interested on the airplanes that sprayed those things. I want to know what law and the exception did you use? You're going to find out it's probably national security and you're going to have to look at that. But where did, have I told you that's going to be found? Was right here in C. Not that it names it, but it tells you the importance of the continual military consequence that exploits its, uh, your ignorance of its imposition on you perpetually. As far back here, again in 2001, where chemtrails were identified as a weapon. But more importantly, C, the term exotic weapon systems, includes weapons designed to damage space or natural ecosystems such as the ionosphere and upper atmosphere or climate weather and tectonic systems with the purpose of the inducing damage or destruction upon a targeted target population or region of Earth or in space. And apparently I said easily again. Thanks, Vince, for the reminder. So, exotic weapon system, they define it, they find everything that, that those these things can do. Right before that, they have chemical, biological, environmental, climate, and tectonic weapons. They wrap it up, and then C brings it forward. Why is this important? Because that's igniting for you, that should be igniting your mind. Where am I going to go read to see that they are going to be able to affect that and affect it in this regard? But what? Title 50. Title 50 is where you're going to find you can't do this, well, except you're us. You can't do this biological imposition unless you're us. You can't do the chemist, the laser weapons unless you're us, U.S. You can't do climate modification unless you're us. So way back in 2001, when people say, oh, this is like the first uh, first acknowledgement. No, no, this is just building in. This is just a coming on to the accept all the status of exceptions that were in Title 50 already. I guess this is my, another problem about that we have a short... We think that everything happened since 2001 is all that there ever was, and that's what we, 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 we've planted our flag in this knowledge. And this is not where it starts at all, but for me, it just it points out when you see, when you look at number C here, even though chemtrails is it's stated right in black and white, they've known it, they've known it since 2001, it was going on. Whatever we were actually seeing, whatever programs were actually going on, they were already talking about, which they denied all the way up until when, when they said that science would now study it. What, 10, 15 years later? But the C is the, com is the statement of inclusion of everything. When you go to Title 50, United States Code, and you read everything that they will have their fingers in, and you look at the title of that, that's from the War Department, and you find the exceptions, you'll realize, again, we're way behind the curve, and we've been duped. And they're exercising authorities that are already sitting there, that anybody could read, that I've read, that I was waiting for them to bring and trigger. I don't know, what, again, I can't tell you what they're going to do. Who knows what's in the mind of fiends. Evil genius. I'm not a genius that way. I mean, maybe we all have our genius. We all have our, our innate, innate genius, I think. It's not sometimes not very comprehensive at some point. But it's there. We have a, a naturalness to us that's kind of a genius. If we'd let it work. But these people are evil genius. And it's been in the, in the, there, this money has been programmed and spent and planned to be spent by the very representatives you thought vote harder was going to help you. And as I've said, there's a big distinction between the federal vote harder and the local vote harder. If it wasn't for the vote harders in the in local area, we would not have the people we've been working with to actually try to make the better change that we need to see back into the things that the government was supposed to do in the correct way. Not this way, where trillions of unmanageable amounts of money, so-called money, are being spent to do these things in the law to you. There's no limitation on that. If you read, if you remember what I just read, there's no limitation that it, it can't not it is not restricted to happen to you. Why? Because Title 50 says there's an exception to us. You don't get to do it. We do. Not you. We us. The U.S. And so I want to, I don't know where the government doesn't want to help you when you need your help, but they're there to help themselves, and we 
are very limited in what we will, if we say anything, I don't see, we're very limited that we say anything, and then of what we say or what we assert is almost non-existent. And it's all speaking through, when you look at Title 50, through this national security imperative to protect itself. And then most people think they're protecting you, and they're not. They're protecting this government that sits in a district. But it's all written in the, in the black and white. Whether I don't remember if this bill passed. The point was it was there. See, it's there. It was there as a knowledge to be known. In 2001, And I'm looking at this thing, man, they're ready to trigger. This is getting ready to trigger. And then what happened in September? This was put in just not even a day, a month after. This thing was already set up to fall. The domino was going to be fallen. It didn't, that didn't happen with box cutters, folks. So. I look at this as a plan, it's a military oper it's continuing military operations. They're building the cage around you, they're making it uh, you know, silent weapons of a kind of war, quiet wars, they're getting the databases, the information precedes you into a, a criminal a characterization, and you uh, enter into that b before you go do the challenge. Well, I've been asking you to do that. I'm trying to think about what Jonathan Corbett, he was a, a, a guy that on the internet, I think he was uh, affecting the TSA, I, I hope someone got, got in touch with him. Maybe you helped him to understand, if he doesn't, understand what I've been saying, because I think it would aid him. This new report would do that. Whether or not you're going to prevail against the the occupier is going to be an interesting point. But see, when you don't question it, we don't know that. When you do question it, you get to see uh, whether their answer is the truth or how stupid it is that they're trying to evade the truth. And to me, that's that's a big deal. I don't know about you. I can use their evasion. If nothing more than the embarrassment and to tell you all, it's not my opinion. Because I think people think this is my opinion when I'm talking about this stuff. And I don't even know that if I, well, I don't know if I have an opinion. I really, I look at it, I start analyzing it. As, I don't analyze something as, what, what do I think about it? I analyze, oh, here's the condition, it's applied to these, these facts, it's applied to this condition, and it's not something that we would like. How are we going to address that? It's not an opinion. It's it's a methodical uh, uh, implement look at an analysis of a condition of reality. I, in that way, regard, I have no thought about it. I'm just laying at everything out and then, okay, now this is what we have. What is going to be our strategy and tactic here? I suppose that could be an opinion, but that's really dictated by the condition, not by well, your thought about it. And so, like I said, I address this a little differently. I accept things that are look like reality opposed to what I think it should be. And I have to, I found more success in adre adopting what it looks to be the reality than trying to make up what I think is supposed to happen. Uh, in other words, if I have an opinion about what the Constitution says and I walk into someone who I've given the authority to make the decision on, then, then I get upset because they don't find my way. It's not the condition I want to walk into and, per and expect to persevere. What I, what I can't expect is I've handed it to somebody else and I should have maybe stepped back two more steps and said, I don't want to do that. What's a different path to eliminate that problem? And it's real easy to have your thumb hit and whacked and feel the pain in your thumb and go for the thumb. It's a little bit harder to uh, step back a couple of times after the pain goes away and figure out maybe I don't want to put that hammer on my thumb next time. How am I going to, how am I going to throw that hammer so that I don't do it? How am I going to hold this next time? How am I going to stop that problem, actually? And a lot of this is what I was also saying last night in the chat. It's not like we're walking in like we have a, a plan because we've experienced it completely before. We have actually have never experienced this. And we have to prevail anyway. And so we go to the what the government does, what it's willing to do, all the money being spent. Remember, the real ID was involved in this. We've already seen so this, the credit that your vehicle has been given, the credit that these travels, it's also social credit. Already in databases. I told you this was already in Pobos. You think it's over in China. I said they're making that obvious and they're perfecting it for their population, but it's already in the system of the United States of America. That report tells you that. But they're treating you as immigrants. And they say non immigrants, but they're teaching you as, they're treating you like, uh, if I was, I've explained before, as a non driver driver. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Maybe it's been long enough. I haven't said it. You get a driver an ID is a, a state ID is a non-driver driver's license. 
because the authority it issues from is the same commerce authority. And so that's what your non-immigrant immigrant is is what you're looking at. They're still in the context of the same authority. And what they got us to believe is that we were part of that. And they gave it. They got obfuscated by all these terms that he called. You know, he's a citizen of the United States in different ways. United States citizen, United States person, United States individual. All these terms. And that's how they do it to you. And you don't step back, and, uh, and I'm not going to say this is an answer, but one of the things is you don't stop back and say, I'm just a man or a woman. What the heck are you doing with this term? And they say, well, but this is the definition. Well, I don't, I'm not in your definition. Where, where did you have the right to mistreat or mischaracterize or, imp- or, or, or impose upon me this characterization at all? Not presume me innocent. Not and steal my right to travel. Make it a pri- privilege. How did you take my right and convert it to lawfully to a privilege? Do any of us have this list of uh, hierarchies in our mind about where they're wrong? To write it down and go test that. As I said, you can go do it on the administrative side with hard. I don't think there's any, uh, uh, there's really much jeopardy. You're going to be considered guilty anyway, so you might as well engage it. I mean, it's not like if you go do that, they're going to put impose anything more upon you. The only thing that you're going to uh, put upon you is what they would do anyway when you decided to not uh, stand in front of the radiation machine, right? You get to get put in that second line. Well, if you have your file set up and your record set up, there isn't no second line. There isn't no, no nothing happening. And it's not like they, they haven't told you now it's national security and, and then you get to now attack that because they've mentioned it's national security. And you now attack the pretext. Under, under what what pretext would even national security allow them to presume you guilty? I don't. I, you're going to have to do the case to tell me because I can't get it. But they ID'd you. They put you in databases. They're centralized. Uh, they, they can use blockchain or not. I don't care. They're, they're a database. They're a central place of authority uh, for authorities to look and do what? Treat it. They tell you right in this document from the DHS. They're already doing They're profiling everybody. And so then I wonder, well, why is the United States attacking Venezuela? They just went to China. China just gave them their their identity card uh, technology, and now Venezuela, being beat down by the United States, is actually implementing the global order for control by Chinese identification tracking systems. A new Venezuelan ID created with China ZTE tracks citizen behavior. So we hear Trump destroying the ZTE, doesn't want to do commerce, and yet the United States DHS is doing the same thing. I guess the government doesn't like competition, right? In in 2008, for how long ago, Venezuelan President, President Hugo Chavez dispatched Justice Ministry officials to visit counterparts in China, Chinese technology hub of Shenzhen. Shenzhen. Their mission, according to a member of the Venezuelan delegation, was to learn the workings of China's national identity card program. Enough said. Again, I read, read, read. Venezuela is uh, rolling out a new ID card manufactured in China that can track, reward, and punish citizens. What did I tell you years and years ago? You'd be going along, driving driving in your car, crossing through an intersection. The light turns red. You're going to have a phone, an ID card, your driver's license. Your wallet's going to be in your pocket or nearby. It's got that big, nice uh, re- re- antenna on the inside built into your uh, your driver's license it's picking up energy it's it's picking up the energy to power itself to send back information of who you are where you are you're going to drive through that intersection and if they're going to check before before you got to the other side they'd have and you're in a yellow light going to red they'll have your bank account interrogated and if you have enough bank account money they'll send you a receipt before you hit the crosswalk on the other side that thank you for doing business with the state for violating that viol- that, that that traffic light and if they find out if your bank account has no money in it you're going to get health fired from a drone. You won't make it across that intersection. They'll have the cleanup crew come out and pick you up. Probably robots. Venezuela going through China is having a card. Go ahead. Real ID, folks. Laugh over there. Real ID through databases of the DHS can track and reward and punish citizens. You think there's a difference, even the United States attacking Venezuela, going after China? Uh, do you think this is a big difference? No, no. This is all an integration. That's all for our entertainment. Now, there's some real things going on there. People are going to die over these confrontations, but it's still for our entertainment. So Venezuela's in on it. For as much as I don't like seeing people oppressed and the old governments of people oppressing their people, this seems to be the way of the world. You don't see it's happening here. 
I'm here to tell you it's happening here. It has been. They've known about it. It's well since on its way since 2001. 2001 gave them the reason for being. And I said at the time I watched the TV and the repeated uh, uh, propaganda psyop going on to show you over and over the carnage, I said they went and done it. I still don't know if I can believe they went and done it, folks. They pulled that trigger. They, the government that's now caught you in a cage. So do you look at the, the falling buildings and, and, and go for 20 years figure out, well, how did they fall? Or do you acknowledge somebody did something and now they're moving with that to do something else that's way worse? And if you think I was joking a long time ago that the, these cards have powered themselves, it finally comes. I, you know, it's kind of like, again, I have an electronics background. I could see it coming. It's just a matter of the technology and the time. Someone put, putting focus on it. I was part of an R&D lab. We kind of did a little bit of this stuff. I could see the potential. I didn't know if it was completely possible at the time because of uh, material science wasn't such that they could do that, but now since then, so much is the size of things have gotten down to where they can now uh, really efficiently run uh, data, uh, and they can now really come down to where they can power stuff up. That the antenna, that the uh, uh, like RFID, the RFID antennas, they now can be adjusted uh, to power the system itself. Batteryless stuff here now, and so here's the proof. If you didn't think your license, I told you, the antenna on your driver's license was going to be the thing that powered the driver's license to identify you and power its circuits. Uh, uh, your real ID was going to do that for you. And then I attached it to maybe your phone would be an amplifier for that thing. It go right from your card to your phone. The phone goes up to the the cell. The the, the uh, police, uh, uh, the AI looks and sees you're going across the red light and decides right there whether or not they can get the money from you at the bank account to pay for it or whether or not they need to drone you. The technology here, battery-less, smart devices closer to reality. And they are doing exactly what I told you. They take the RFID antenna. They now cut it in a certain spot. They now put a little device inside it so they can transfer the energy. And then they repower the circuit. So I've got that link to you. I don't even need to, to talk more. I'm just telling you that the it's predictable, folks. Was, what they had coming was all written down. All anybody was in any kind of technology instead of looking at the next, I, the next iPhone or whatever, the next flashy gadget. There was some real technology underneath this that were the parts and pieces to what is being put has been put together for you today. And that smart ID, so SMART is not so intelligent. That ID is going to be all this technology now becomes self-powered. And guess what? They do it for the uh, the energy coming from uh, from the walls. You think Tesla had it? Yeah, he had it, and they're picking it up, folks. Pretty simple. It's all it's in just inductive. Uh, inductive, uh, and this is case, the antennas are actually in, in, inductive uh, tuning. It's it's there. It's just it's, it's, do you want to apply it, and how are you applying it? And look at what they're doing. Instead of going through the, what Tesla had some ideas that good could work, instead of his experimental stuff, the stuff that he could work, they didn't go that way, did they? No, they go this way. Take a step back. Look at why. Why would you do that? Why would a nation of why would multiple nations do this? And why would they do it all by the same plan? Well, maybe it's just a good idea, right? Well, that could be. Or maybe it's even more. That's a good idea that they're all in on. And you haven't heard anything different behind the woodshed forever. I mean, this is what the evidence of the facts have happened. They roll out before us, all for us to see if you just settle down and go read the black and white and say, stop saying, well, okay, I know that. But no, not just know that you know that. Look to see the evidence of its application in the world toward a particular end, given you have that insight. Just like I told you years ago about your phones, what they would do, how they would, be, how would, they would interact, how they would power stuff. They wouldn't need their batteries at some point. Now, whether or not the phones may get away from that, I don't, I'm not so sure, because that has to repower back to a place and so there may still need to be these batteries. It's not going to be an end-all, be-all. But for the sensor gathering and communication side, they've got it wired, folks. They've got it wired. Here's the I just read the evidence. They're finally working on someone focused on it. They needed it. They knew they needed it. This has been going on for decades. So keep thinking you got it understood or have it understood and go work, work against these things. I'd really love to see some people address this pretext that they've set up, it was all predictable, 
It happened. There it is as a proof right there. Then they used it to take and do what they're doing, sticking you in a, a transparent cage. You complain about it, but you won't take a you won't write a simple letter and persist to to now work that back through and show that you don't uh, that you object. What what's the threat, folks? I mean, they already think that you're a prisoner in a in a cage. What what else what else can they do to you? I, I guess you could say, well, they'll they'll interrupt my my agreement to my servitude. I'm a voluntary. I'm a voluntarist. So, bat powering uh, things without batteries, pretty cool. It's just inductive tuning. Uh, love it. I think it's pretty great. Uh, this is now applied to our technology that gets smaller and smaller, uses less and less energy to power it, needs, needs, and, and so these things can start working like they never could before. Uh, but uh, then we move into the other control. You've got the social credit. You know they can be punished and rewarded. And Venezuela, a place is being destroyed economically, is moving into the cryptocurrency in the digital world. Go to China for the technology. I told you China would be the hub for the technology. The United States denies it and then imposes it through DHS. They do all the same stuff with right different means, so you don't think you don't see it. But so moving on to this, uh, you no, know, the reward system and the money and the crypto and the powering. Now they got a wall. You could have a card now that's actually registered that it powers itself. You could do this, uh, what we call decentralized stuff, where you look at all the mo models of blockchain. Everybody's plugged into the blockchain. How decentralized is that? Oh, I can have my wallet and my computer. That's not decentralized. Somebody who conditions that blockchain is the one that's going to control it. And I find it fascinating on people that are excited. And I, I told you, some of this technology is great. I, I believe that the blockchain, I don't know about the blockchain, a, a method of keeping value in a digital form uh, independent, completely non-dependent on the system is really a, a viable thing if you would just figure, someone figure that out. Don't try to get sucked into the system to be recognized as valuable. This is where the speculators are running. And I'm amazed at how many people are adherents of, block, of, of crypto uh, currencies and things and are astonished of how they're being treat, treated when they go to the system. Again, a little bit of reading will explain the parameters by which the standard will be set. You then can you can choose to decide whether you're going to volunteer into that or decide to avoid it and how to be avoided. How did the guys? How did the people get the get the stuff off the boat to the to Malibu? Was by surfboards. They couldn't do it by a boat, but they had to do it by a surfboard. That may be the decision again, as I kick us back to there. But today we're talking. I got two articles here talking about these ICOs of regarding these crypto coins and their acceptance by the system as securities. They now have advanced these into getting acceptance by the system. The system will define them. And if the definition doesn't match, they're not going to allow uh, that to happen within their, their realm of authority. I say when they show you where their realm of authority is, you know where it isn't. And those of you that want to utilize regulation, I guess you go there. Those of us that would rather have different we now know where the line is, and we would want to make sure that we hold the line. That A couple of stories have come back through. Uh, the, I always work this word decentralized. It's fascinating to me. Based on where this has to go and what they try to do, I don't, I think I'm look, I don't know what people think in their minds about this stuff. Again, how do you decentralize by going to a central regulator? How do you decentralize when the ledger that's, that you're using is in one spot? Oh, you have a private wallet terminal that you can get at it from anywhere, but it still goes to the same place. And now it's going to, they want to be regulated, and then you fret over that, and then you hear these stories that says that once you did these exchanges, and the SEC stepped in and said you could be a regulable body that didn't get permission, then you wonder why that's the case, and then you accept that the fines were okay against the ICO for these cryptocurrencies, that is really tight, it's going to be tied into the system anyway. It's going to be tied into that system of, of punishment, of reward. It has to be. That's where it's going. That's why they're allowing it. The test is still going, it's still an ongoing. We heard the World Bank is involved. They're, they're working, working out the problems, but they think it's workable. That was said, what, years ago we, we got that report. Uh, that the decentralized exchanges were supposed to be invincible from a, from a legal perspective. 
It's difficult, the theory goes, for regulators to crack down on individuals who build their exchanges as they have neither oversight nor official ties for such exchanges, which instead operate purely by algorithms. And I find this an interesting dialogue going on between the twist of an exchange versus an algorithm that drives it, that, that, that allows it. it. These are two different things, completely like apples and oranges. But people don't understand the connections here, and they start commingling all this stuff. And I think it leads to people having to do things that they don't understand they maybe didn't need to do, which is what I look at. Because if this crypto thing is supposed to work, it's going to have to work in a very narrow path. You're going to have to be the surfboard trying to get your stuff to shore. Not, not the boat, not the registered this, not the registered that, if I can use this analogy. This story says that the, uh, talks about the problem, right off the bat, decentralized exchanges. They're not, those exchanges are not decentralized. They're, they have to go to some place. Somebody under regulation has to be accountable. That's, that, had, by definition, has to happen. And now you're brought into the subject, uh, person subject, if you will. The person subject and person liable. No, they've got it. That can't be decentralized on by definition. Yet, some people have been trying to make these uh, uh, offerings. And they're now being slapped with fines. In this case, uh, uh, Ether Delta was a founder. Zachary Coburn was slapped with a $300,000 $300, fine. They go through and on this article to have a discussion about, oh, the wringing their hands about how we, well, we knew it could be like this. It might be the problem. Uh, this is, couldn't be expected. We were hoping for difference. And the whole time they're looking for approval. And then a, a bit astonished, although they claim not to be, how the system responds to that. Now, I'm not analyzing how the SEC is doing it. They're just coming back and they're making these statements. And it's an administrative condition. And my trouble is, if, if this thing is a good idea, no one seems to understand the game enough to be able to address it, and they're already capitulating to the authority, even though they're not inside it. And there's been a question of whether the SEC is regulating or not regulating, and then something came down here just recently, like the lid's coming down, that uh, everyone who's in it is saying, oh, the lid's coming down. And I'm looking at it saying, well, why don't you know your due process right? In the news that was once startling, the altogether expected now, first it's away, first it's separate, and not, not subject, now it's all expected now. Uh, the SEC today announced that two ICO-created startups have agreed to pay fines. Not for doing anything scammy or obviously fraudulent, but for simply failing to ask the regulator's blessing, just like virtually every other ICO ever conducted. So the complexions completely change relative to legalization of legalization of these ICOs for crypto exchanges. Crypto exchanges. In a statement, the SEC revealed settled charge changes against Carrier EQ, Air Fox, and Paragon Coin, which both conducted ICOs in 2017. After the Commission warned the ICOs can be secure, can be security. After the commission warned that ICOs can be securities offerings in its DAO report of investigation, this is the first time the CA has publicly acknowledged penalties levied against companies, quote, solely for ICOs security offerings registration violations, close quote. In other words, these companies, like hundreds of others, simply do not register their token offerings with the commission. I'm going to stop right there. Those of you that are in it may think you understand what's going on and may, whatever your attitude about this is. But right there was the problem. They're looking right past. These companies made a payment on something that the SEC said can happen. Instead, I want to ask you why are these uh, or exchanges, so-called, where it's now you can be guilty for not, where there's no law that says you have to, where there's a can why wasn't a letter sent back and demanding the assertion of due process for the SEC to have declared they were one that was not just can, but must file, and then the opportunity to file? Why do they pay the charge up front without challenging due process? Is my problem with this almost the entirety of everything I speak about? Why do we walk into culpability and liability to an agency that says can, should, would, might, instead of saying, well, then you're going to have to tell me 
Give me a notice that you suspect that I might be. How? And then give me the hearing, and then tell me when to st- how, what to stop, why to stop, and how long to stop, and then by what condition I can respond to not have to stop. Is a problem I have with almost everybody I see, and I think these guys are intelligent, intelligent people working through this crypto stuff, and they're just, but they'll give in to the authority that they are trying to say that they want to be distanced from, but they want permission for. It's got to be a mental problem. And every point, looking and saying, oh, where did my you know, the government oppresses me? Now, unless I've got this kind of not understood, it seemed to me when I saw the statement where they already paid and the SEC says can be subject and they didn't, their lawyer, their attorneys didn't send a letter, well show us how we are, how you suspect it where do I get that standard folks? Go to Title 26 that's the tax code the commissioner, when this commissioner suspects that you're a person liable, you're a business entity, you can see it's corporations that they're dealing with, is a person liable that shall give a notice of the, of the hearing to, to have the meeting that declared where, uh, whereupon the investigation will happen and the commissioner will declare what's to be taxed, where, the records and books to keep, and where to keep those. That's all, that's all I'm applying here for those of you that wonder what I do. Go read the tax code. There's a due process built into it. I've said this before. It's why people that are got tax liabilities and things, I, I think they're, they're a bit of a walking wounded. They went inside the statute to, to try to defend themselves from it. When I said, My point is, why did you attach it first? Why did you allow it to be attached? It's the same thing here with this crypto. And I think because, I guess to the point, let me get to the point and move on. The crypto, like I said, it has some power. But it's going to be in a non-legalized uh, condition. And then there has to be people who trust that. Then possibly it could be an alternative medium of payment for things or transfer of value. But not with this kind of, it looks to me to be an insanity. When I believe it's answered pretty quickly, when an authority talk comes against you, especially when you either have a law that says it's not supposed to, or they admit it's not necessarily definite. The smallest of question in that is your need to demand, either demand a hearing, which I would say you didn't demand a hearing. You're intending to violate my rights. It's it's one thing to be said you, you can, and then you feel you're guilty, than it is to say, wait a minute, you never gave me the, you never gave me the uh, message that I was, which required a notice before that, that we sat down together and you explained how. Not continue the question and not do it, although it would it would affect all the others, I guess, because each case is on a case-by-case basis. It would determine it for you. Why wasn't that done here? Now, I'm not asking that as an answer. I don't. They're doing it another way. I'm saying I see basic and fundamental due process failures in any one of these people, whether it's the corporation or the man behind the corporation or the woman or whatever. And I, I don't know, do I repeat that again? Do you, re, do you perceive the problem when an agency or an authority talk comes on and says, you can be liable? And you say, okay, I'll pay you $300,000. Does that sound sane? Is that, is that not much different than the guy, the kid over there in, in what, Eagle Point? You jaywalked. Your dog has fleas. Bang, bang, bang. So he took lead. He didn't give, he didn't give silver. He took lead. Is there any difference there? But the system of authority isn't even listening for your objection. Why? Because you've been crickets for so long. They don't have to anymore. I'm asking the people that are in crypto, Rethink about what's going on here. You might three hundred thousand bucks. I mean, I guess you got it to spend. But when I hear can, could, should, to me that's a question of due process violation. Why well, wasn't the first two sentences out of your uh, in response? Not I'll pay your fee, your fine. Where was my notice? And, and I have a suspicion they don't even have a provision for a notice. But I'm not going to go that far. I'm just going to say I'd be looking for it. Why? Because it's not something they've dealt with before. 
But if it's like the tax code, so I jump back one more step. I say, well, let's pretreat it like the tax code. The tax code says in it. You got to go read it. I don't know what the. I'm not. I'm not a uh, photographic memory to tell you exactly. They have their special language in there. But look for the paraphrase that says the commissioner will find if it if the commissioner finds a uh, an activity that looks to be liable, it'll issue a notice to get you in to do the analysis to find out what the tax, what the liability is, and what the amount of taxes are what the books are to keep, and where to keep those books. And I think there's a fifth one. Did any of you anywhere ever ask for that before, under any kind of a demand of the government? Would be a good model to follow for yourself. You want to talk about models? I don't have them. They're in the law for you to follow. The model is you get a notice. When you didn't get the notice, your first comment is, I didn't get the notice. Now, what, what authority are you coming by here? And if you do have the authority, why aren't you giving me the notice? You stick on the notice apart until they give it to you. Okay, you're right. We, we caught, You caught us. And I don't say that out of not having experience. That's exactly what I did years and years and years before I was facing mortality at five cops. Somehow you understand, if you think about, you understand how to respond when we're not all clouded with a lot of stuff like the internet wants to give us. Years and years and years. First thing I would ask, well, you, you're communicating with me, but what's your authority to communicate with me? And then you look at their answer, and if it's a lie, you catch them there. But now I know more, so I'm not going to talk because I didn't know that then, but just past that is I didn't know. Just before that, I knew what I'm telling you then. You you should too. And so this should be something that we all know, because this is before I started getting in deep on how how this thing works out. But it makes sense to me. You'd at least ask the authority, why are they looking at you? I'm presumed innocent. What did you see? And But now you're demanding something without a notice that you could demand. Okay, I guess enough. I hope you see that there's a, a way at this. I don't know about this crypto stuff, about the SEC, and why they want to do all this. But those that want to, why would you pay? Because someone just asserted you could be in violation, and then the response is, okay, then I'll give you 300000 bucks. That is the model for our destruction. And if you get anything about what I'm trying to get you to see, is how to take your two steps back procedurally, formally, to make the demand that put that, that asserts your right to the proper due process. It doesn't mean you won't be found liable to something. That's not what I'm talking about. That's up to you continually to figure out. What I'm saying is that you just agree to be subject, and you, you know, not in a condemnation. Otherwise, other other than it is a condemnation, I'm not condemning you. You condemn you in almost everything you'll see if I've ever seen people do in the government and with the government about any piece of paper it issues. And then we complain about it. Or we make excuses. I, I don't know. It's Like I said, it, it looks like to more like it's becoming an insanity. And that's our responsibility to fix in us. And I say we can do it by st stepping back away from the, get away from the edge, stop wanting to jump in, if you find yourself in over, start crawling out. And we can do it with really simple little letters here. What would have been so hard that we didn't hear it reported had we seen that they asked what the cause was that invoked the authority to impose? When did we have our first meeting that you gave me notice you could? Not I could, but you could. When did we move? What was your letter that we moved from can to does. And I, that little thing right there is all, I think, in a nutshell, is anything I'm trying to get you to see is where you go every time with any of this. Advance of that would be like the miners saying, where, here's a delegation of authority restriction, restraint on your authority in this one sentence. Where do you have power to do what you're doing? It's almost the same thing. In that case, though, you're identifying the restraint before, not asking the question of declaring the can or the meeting that might have the can to decide does have authority, is liable, an opportunity to stop, cease and desist, and then you get the step back. This is not supposed to be strict liability either. And yet we adopt it. We you voluntary this on ourselves. I don't get that. I'm really confounded by this and dumbfounded. And then you see this stuff, all this digital thing coming down. Everything, everyone inside the system knows what's going on. 
And we hear this little story. I don't know the background to it, but it's just the ridiculousness that comes up. All this databasing and computer technology and all this stuff we see, and we see all the failure in the AI and how it fails and what it does. And we, notwithstanding that, we keep pushing the cherry red buttons of, of how the, the greater technocratic future. And then we hear this story. Japan's cybersecurity minister has never used a computer. Japan's new cybersecurity minister has dumbfounded. I was dumbfounded, apparently. A lot of other people dumbfounded in his country by saying that he never used a computer. So we see the extremity from not even using a computer, all the ones that believe they know what they're using a computer, and can tell you exactly all the vulnerabilities that you're safe and secure, is another thing you throw on the DHS. On top of their failure to have the hearing that says you were a person liable to all these programs, now that you, you didn't even contact me first to see about the program, you didn't give me an opportunity to ask you about the actual security. Who do you have working on these things? How did you figure out, uh, stop the, the, the meltdown hardware program, uh, the scepter problem? How did you fix all that in your computer systems? For vaccines, what does this mean where it says I can, my little my girl or, da or son can suffer death? On the product data sheet. Not in my, my opinion, it says right here. Have we lost our sense anymore in this world? Any of us. That we can't ask the simplest of questions. You don't have to be like me. I had to go the, literally, I went the hard way. But I apparently had to go the hard way. But look at what it's done for me as a foundation. I believe is pretty formidable. Whether or not any of you want, to, some of you that they are my detractors, it doesn't matter to me. I know what we do. I know what I do with what I know. I know how fast I can do it. I know how it helps us. And so I'm asking us to step up because if I can kind of do it being kind of reset in my mind that, oh, everything, America was a great, we have my head in the clouds. That I think lots of people can do it. And I think actually when I hear people, they have a lot more, I think they have a lot more sense in them than maybe that I did at the time I was looking. I really wanted to be oblivious to all this nonsense. I think I, you kind of know it, but you just kind of want to put it, it can't be that bad. Well, folks, it's that bad. Today, I've been telling you, it's that bad. Okay, maybe that's the title of the broadcast, it's that bad. I don't know. It's that bad, and we're being crickets. And that's that's our that's our Achilles heel. It's going to maintain that, and they're going to, these people that do this, uh, are are exploiting that in us. That, that failure in us is being exploited. And and I don't know what more to say about that. And we don't respond to it. You hear, from 2001, they put in a bill about chemtrails. All the time for a decade after the everybody denied it or was cricket. There were crickets on the point of it. Think about that against us, folks. You can't... I don't see how anybody can disregard that and just keep their... And not take an action someplace. I guess I can have my detractors on that, but I don't understand what they're going to expect and what time is being wasted to, if any actions they do take and how they can have a, a complaint at all if they're not willing to take any action. We're dealing with people in the system that have no experience at all. They profess to have experience. This is the education system also. Again, you know, you might get a license, but that's not doing what you know or even how to do something. That's just telling you that you're coming underneath the license that says, by definition, you're doing something criminal. But if you do it like this, we're going to say it's okay. Think about that. And this is the problem with the national security exceptions under Title 50. They get, get us all the way back to them. We're going to give ourselves license. It's a crime what we're going to do, but we're going to give ourselves license to do that much. If we can even just make the magical phrase, I feared for my life as a nation, then we get to do whatever we want. has to be something you in intelligently look at and approach and attack to stop this nonsense that allows this, this stuff we look out in the world and see to be affecting our lives, and we say nothing about it. Again, even the most expert in these fields can't solve all vulnerabilities. And they have no right, no matter what costume they put on, to call you a criminal or a terrorist 
before they have probable cause to believe. And we'll scream and yell how much probable cause we have to have, articulable basis, but what's your authority, this and that, but we don't, won't address it in the more correct way and make a formal record of it. And as I've told you, it doesn't have to be that complicated. These agencies, this agency world is running our roughshod over things. You can, if you look deep enough in that, and I don't have to go too deep either, you see the rules are law. That should have given you a clue. And that's why they give you processes under APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, every, whether it's the government, federal government or state government. There's procedures that have to be followed. You have to read those. It's how you will partly address this. If you're dealing with the DHS, you will definitely have to address that. That's how you're going to go through there. I told you this a long time ago before the Supreme Court made the statement. You will have to address DHS because of this, this, the, the pretext of national security requires this will be in a position of administrative uh, addressment. Because when you get to the judiciary, they just say you don't have that imperative. They do. And you lose that fast. And there's no authoritative record to the contrary. It's that fast and that easy to understand. So your APA is important to understand why I keep referring to it. Why in some of these issues that you really may not be underneath underneath some jeopardy when you're doing with the, je with the uh, administrative side, that it, this should be a, a training platform at this late date for all of us so that we aren't having to worry. Like my first case was in, was a, well, it wasn't that bad either because it was ma mainly just a fine, but you still, I still had to come up with the money that I probably didn't have at the time. I don't really ever had many years. I really haven't had that much money to worry about, uh, partly because of this decision that you notice it's, there's, it's just a fiction of fiat anyway. But at any rate, uh, it, in my first case where I engaged it, I didn't have the threat really of prison. So I went at it. I just flew at it. There was nothing I didn't try. To, no rock I left unturned as I found procedures to interfere with the due process, which was actually to my benefit. And eventually it played that work out. But see, I had nothing really to lose more than losing the case that I likely would have lost anyway in a fine. Not, not a jail time. It's what this administrative thing allows you. You're not going to jail to do this administrative stuff. But in this APA, and through the DHS, and you can attack that, and the SEC, you can attack that. All this is sitting there in due process side. Their failure, essentially, is this thing I've been talking to you about. Uh, we're talking about the comments that we're going through for these agency things and the, the, the anomalies and oxymorons, the conundrums they create. And we have another story here moving into kind of the agency theme and how to respond. Moving outside, of, uh, continuing in the military side, the war on drugs. Out come a story to, uh, that I uh, think it might have been Gary L. passed this along. Uh, synthetic THC is safer than actual weed, according to the DEA. Can I read that again? Just catch your attention. Synthetic THC is safer than actual weed, according to the DEA. And so I'm not going to get too deep in all this. I don't want to do all this analysis and all the disgust that you can feel about this and how stupid that sounds. But you have to take that disgust and turn it into some action. The DEA has officially decided that a notorious fentanyl manufacturer's synthetic marijuana product is safer and more medically viable than actual weed. Now, I just want to stop there. I don't really have to read more. Relative to free the weed and relative to the nonsense about regulation and Schedule 1, and then remember... I read that document of the international, uh, they wanted to be, in, uh, the agencies wanted to be informed for the international's position regarding cannabis. They include the fentanyl products, which are killing people. That was all in that one comment, remember? So those of you that stepped up to that, you now can pull this off, pull this together. Synthetic THC is safer than actual weed. Well, safer? Safer. Is safer and more medically viable. More medically viable? I thought they said it has no use medically. Period. Zero. Nothing. And the FDA agrees with this? Is proof from them that they're lying. We use lots of terms, arbitrary, capricious, whatever you want to go through. Right there in the first paragraph. Not was saying the nonsense of a synthetic thing and may not necessarily be the same thing, and is actually from fentanyl manufacturers shows that they do harmful things. 
and that's okay. You got that right here too. Again, it's about the bottom line, not about the truth and reality. You have everything here in the title and the first paragraph that I've been asking anybody to start collecting up for themselves and writing down in bullet points. They actually tell us here, they'll move it once they go from safer, which is challengeable, and more medically viable. Remember, they have a standard to meet. You can challenge in every one. But they said that they're willing on that level to move it to Schedule 2. Why? So the doctors keep control of it. Well, it then means it's medically viable again. It's something of value at all. So this document from them tells that they've been lying. It's fraud. They're not intending to do the way it's supposed to be done. They want to hand this to people that have known killers. And I don't know why someone can't put that, and maybe someone else, because we do have a commenter on that, uh, put that together. It says, the Schedule 1, which is reserved for drugs that have no, currently no currently accepted medical use. How can they say it's safer if it has no use, or that it's more medically valuable if it has no use? It's a fascination, at least, to me. And they always remember, like it was in the international comment period, was stating that they also has a high potential for abuse. I don't know about you, but everything we see that's synthesized and concentrated develops a high uh, potential for abuse that we can show that is a lie, a fraud on the cannabis side, on a natural intake. But they're handing now what they claim to be uh, having a high potential abuse in a concentrated form to a company that makes a killing addiction drug already it is ripe for disclosure I suppose and so administratively you can go on this again I told you this is the right side of history this has fallen apart the first and so I, I wanted to respond to this because there people are coming out about how oh, the, the absurdity of the DA doing this I say one step at a time again in my in my Twitters I try to be instructive where I can one step at a time quote more medically valuable than actual weed close close quote, exposes agency created fraud to declare no THC medical use. More valuable is relative. What potential abuse? Arbitrary and capricious. Agency collusion preferring profit to truth. And then I make the statement, make a comment with this and more or make wine. W-H-I-N-E. If you don't do these things in a comment, you're just whining. And I don't know what the question and point is and what the objection is when they do these absurd things. As I said, as I restated, it's, it's right there in the documentation, the news. When you understand what the, what the, the process and procedures are about, you start looking at their consistency with the order of things in the black and white, and if they miss, that's what you hit them on. And if they're uh, you, and if they haven't made a record, or they don't want to make a record, you make the record. You make a phone call to someone, and they don't want to send you a letter, and you make a phone call, you make the letter. You just describe the conversation. And so, lots of things that you can do. I don't. I'm not having a whole lot of sympathy for those that are just making wine. Uh, and I just can't encourage more activity for those that are jumping in wherever they can. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said will give you an insight, give you some kind of encouragement to go stride out and do what you can do. Thank you, Grimner, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and all the other places that Grimner has allowed us to be at iHeart and all that stuff. And we're at SoundCloud and then we're at YouTube and all that. And thank you to everyone that strips this out and puts this on wherever you put it out. I appreciate that. Uh, any, any way we can get the information out, I appreciate it. And I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Until next time, Journey with Purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 